that picks up pretty well. Welcome to Startup Week. And today we've got Ryan Roberts, Dallas Deal Terms, Seed and Venture Capital. But before we get there, I'd like to thank our sponsors, of course, for making this freely available to all of us. We have Chase, Downtown Dallas Inc., Vela Wood, Touch Titans, Dev Mountain, Kirkus, Credos, and many, many more. And a special thanks to the base camp here uh, and Chase as well. If you're using social media, be sure to use the hashtag DSW16. Okay, so that's my bit. Now I'll introduce our legal track leader, John Lindsay. Thank you. Uh, my name is John Lindsay. I'm a patent attorney. I recognize a few faces from uh, my presentation yesterday. So uh, anyway, as he mentioned, yes, I am the track leader, and part of my goal was to get uh, relevant subjects to you guys. And so part of what made me ask Ryan to participate in this is that as a patent attorney, I uh, businesses are often formed around the intellectual property slash patent that's being filed, and usually I'll get kind of blanket statements like, um, you know, I want to maintain control of my LLC. I want 51% control, and I just hear kind of stupid, uh, kind of uninformed statements about that as well, too. And that's the only element of a deal that they're concerned about. And I say, hold on, you need to talk to somebody to help you understand a little bit more about the deal. It's not just uh, 50, 51%. There could be issues such as, uh, you know, having directors inserted uh, on the board and other issues like that. So it's a lot more involved than uh, just having, quote, 51% of majority ownership or something like that. So anyway, that's why I thought this topic would be useful to you guys. So I'm going to turn it over to Ryan. Thanks, John. Hi, everybody. Ryan Roberts. Uh, I'm, I always say, like, what, what do I do? And I'm a startup lawyer. I'm also call myself a venture attorney. If I went to, like, the Dallas Bar Association, I wouldn't tell anybody I did that because they wouldn't understand what I would do. I'd say, I'm a corporate securities attorney who represents emerging technology companies and venture capitals, venture capitalists in uh, financing transactions. So that's why it's startup lawyer. I think people think I just started. I've actually had my own practice for a little over 10 years now. Partner at Roberts Foster LLP. We're a boutique shop in South Lake, Texas, which some of you, like, that's a, this is a bubble out here. It's a bubble out there. I think a lot of you think that the furthest west you've been is, like, Terminal D, and then it's, like, Los Angeles. So there is something between Los Angeles and Terminal D at DFW, and that's where we're located at. Uh, we're pretty lucky. We definitely have a great client base in Texas, but a good majority of the clients or the deals that we work on are outside of Texas. And I think that gives us a pretty good perspective on not just deals in general, but if people are doing deals here now. And Dallas used to be much more of a closed environment, meaning that if you were a Dallas company, you pretty much got funding from Dallas-based investors or else you moved. There's a lot of successful companies that have, that were Dallas companies uh, that essentially had to move and attract venture funding outside of here. Probably the biggest uh, example of that is probably, a recent example is Ustream. They started out here, they started their first prototype in Deep Ellum and couldn't get local funding and went out to the Valley and sold, I think, a couple months ago. So that's a little bit about what we do uh, in the history. And so I think the purpose that I wanted to help today or provide knowledge or whatever I could today is if you're a company or thinking of raising money here or just want to know what the heck is going on here because we've had a sort of a new res a resurgence or a surgence of like new investors, VCs. I know there was a panel I think a couple hours ago that started or maybe just finished 20 minutes ago. We have a couple VC clients on that panel um, just to help you sort of sort through all this mess. So how many of you are like have raised capital recently, like looking to raise capital, and you don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to. I'm not judging. I'm just trying to get a flavor thing. All right, cool. Uh, can I ask like, and I, I say this is like the, I should probably bring up my next slide first. So I was like, what, what quote should I have? And if you know me a little bit, I definitely don't sugarcoat anything. And I think people from like Dallas Morning News or used to be Dallas Business Journal will call me up and get like the contrary quote, I'll call it. And I'm happy to give it, but really what I'm trying to do is provide some like realistic perspective about what's going on. And hopefully that it comes off, could be, oh, he's a downer about the community or downer about things in general. But I think if you actually talk to people, they're very excited. It's amazing that the skyline was all orange yesterday, but people are still having trouble on the ground here, on the street, trying to raise capital from, from people. So this hopefully will 
you know, uh, I won't say keep it real, but uh, we'll definitely, uh, I call it, like, this is like the safe zone, or we can say what we want in here, except I think Danielle is live tweeting it, and this is being recorded, obviously, so maybe it's not as safe as you think. And that is my bio slide. Uh, quick overview, just some of like the seed round, venture capital round structures. What are the most common economic terms? What are the most common control terms that you see in both seed and venture capital financings? And then a uh, very long bullet point. What to expect in rules to raise capital in Dallas, AKA what the heck is going on in Dallas? That's too long, sorry about that. Uh, and then hopefully some Q&A. And if you want to ask a question, during, like totally fine, um, I'll answer it and we can have a good discussion. Uh, so the first part to start is like what is seed financing and what's venture capital financing? The lines have definitely blurred the last three to four years. Like historically, a seed financing was, oh, up to your first million dollars, that's seed. Everything after that is a series A round or it's a, it's a venture capital round. But due to like the good times they say have gone on with startups, Seed rounds, people are doing like a $5 million seed round now. I remember the first time this sort of happened to me was four years ago. We had a client at Y Combinator, and they said, oh, we're doing a $4.5 million round. And I called it their Series A. And they're like, ha, huh, that's not our Series A. What are you talking about? It's a seed round. So uh, there's some optics there. And that's sort of come to Dallas. If clients are raising two, three million, it's not, and even if they have a venture capital fund in the round, they don't want to call it their venture capital round or their seed round. So the lines have been blurred there. Uh, and why does this matter? From a structural standpoint, terms tend to differ between a seed round and a venture capital round, or let's call it a, a series A. So from a strategic standpoint, it's been more beneficial to some founders and early stage companies now if they can categorize their round successfully as a seed round or a series A round. A seed round instead of a series A round. Uh, and so the next slide is like what these structures are. So you're doing your seed round and it could be anywhere from a dollar or 50K and I think the highest I've seen is like five million. After that, it gets kind of ridiculous to say, this is our you know, $12 million seed round. No one really believes that. Uh, but venture capital rounds, anywhere from one to 100 million, obviously you see some big rounds that the unicorns do over 100 million, but primarily it's, it can start from one. Now they're, let's say, five million and up, but they still happen at one million. Uh, Ironically, in Dallas, you might have some investors that will say, hey, let's do the full-on venture capital round at 100K. And let's do the full-blown venture capital documents, which will cost you like 40K to use. Probably not the best investment is to sell off like 12% of your company to cover legal fees on that. So that, that has happened out here. Not as much recently, but it happens. But the, so the most common structures are is first convertible notes. Are, is any of you familiar with convertible notes? Basically, it's just, it's a loan to the company that an investor gives you with the idea that in the future, some trigger, it will convert into equity at your next round, we'll call it. There's usually economic incentives, obviously, for, for that. You get a discount. So just quick example, I'm coming in. Uh, your next round is valued at $2 million. I get to convert as if I invested at a million dollar valuation. Uh, the next part, portion is convertible equity. That's the same exact thing as convertible debt, except it's just not a debt instrument. It's convertible debt without interest, without a maturity date. Very sort of newish, founder favorable way to finance your company. Uh, there's some docs that are out there now, like Y Combinator put out the SAFE documents. Uh, 500 startups put out the KISS documents. We, we've seen those used here. So I think a lot of practitioners or people say, oh, that's just what they do in the valley. That's all that magic they do out there. But it happens here. We've had clients successfully use it. We even had some of our VC clients invest in those types of instruments. So don't let people beat you down and say, oh, you're in Dallas. You can't do that. Uh, venture capital round, preferred equity, full-blown Series A round, hoist of 
economic and control terms. I don't have a whole lot of time, so I can't go deep into them, but I'll go into some of, of what they are. Um, on the, yeah. So. Yeah, so yes, what's the typical price cap on a convertible note? Price cap on a convertible note is, it used to be, and I'll give a quick background on it, so why we haven't got to price caps. It used to be you just got a discount on the next round. So like eight years ago, all convertible notes had, you get a 25% discount on the next round. Well, what happened? It got a lot cheaper to run and develop a startup, right? You're not spending like a million dollars on a server anymore. So these things went longer and longer. And if you waited two years for your next round, your investor was like, wait, I was in two years ago when you guys were like, you know, a guy and a girl and that was it. Now you have like 30 people and all I get is a 25% discount. So they said, hey, we want to create what's the maximum valuation that I will convert in your, in your convertible note. So instead of just 20% discount, it will say something like, worst case scenario, I will convert at a valuation of X, and X is the price cap. And so you asked, what's the typical one? I've seen them as low as $1 million, which is like really low. I think if you just ask me what typical caps are, anywhere from two to five for like true early stage, uh, they can go a little lower. I saw a deal across my desk that had a cap at like 25. Uh, so there, there's are definitely like the outliers, like the $1 million is the outlier, the 25 million is the outlier. If I had to guess, I'd say four or five. Um, so these two types of deal terms, economic control. Economic is obviously like the money terms. And the, the biggest deal term is, is valuation. And there's pre-money and post-money valuation. Does anybody know, does anybody not know what a pre-money valuation is? That's okay. So everybody knows. Okay, Bradley doesn't know. Yeah, okay. Pre-money valuation is what's the value of your company immediately before the investment. Post-money, it follows, is what is the valuation of your company immediately after. So if I'm like, say I'm, say I'm the VC, Bradley, million dollars in your company at a $4 million pre-money valuation. That means post-money is $5 million. Uh, and for that one million, I'll have, I can do math, 20% of the company. It's one divided by five. And I had this tweet I sent out uh, four months ago. It's sort of embarrassing because there's only like three likes on it, which is I think really low for a tweet. Uh, but I put is like, I'll watch Shark Tank when they stop talking in post money numbers. So if you get anything from this presentation, realize that Shark Tank is just thinks you're stupid. And they say, if it's Robert or whoever says, uh, so tell us why your company is worth $5 million. Well, they're talking in post-money numbers, not pre-money numbers. So I'm waiting for the first entrepreneur on the show to say, I don't think, so Bradley's example. Bradley, why is your company worth $5 million? Bradley would say, no, I think it's worth four. It's worth five after your money's in. So that's one thing they just sort of mix up on the show. And I think a lot of founders sort of mix that up too. But that's definitely one of the big economic terms. That's, that, that's probably like the big term that everybody like worries about the most, price cap. And price cap technically is an evaluation. But, uh, but then there's several ways that an investor can affect your pre-money valuation. And by effect, I mean, let's ultimately reduce what we say we're giving you. And so there's terms like a liquidation preference. So I can say, in that same deal with Bradley, $1 million. Typically, the liquidation preference is like one time is my money. It's used as like downside protection. Uh, some people, you'll get a term sheet, and we've seen term sheets out here that say, 4x my money. So if Bradley sells the next day for $5 million, I get four, the founders get one. Was the valuation really $4 million? No, it was a, a lower effective. That's one way to do it. They can do it, obviously, through like payment of dividends or dividends that accrue, anti-dilution, uh, and then the option pool. There's a lot of other ways to do it. Those are the main things. Uh, there's control terms. And I think most people think, as John said at the beginning, I don't have control. As long as I have 50.001% of the company, I have control. And that can be true. But I can create a company where if I give Bradley 
I'm using an example. Come on, go next. Okay, Bradley, I'll give you nine million shares. I'll have one share, and I can ha I can create control of the company with that one share. So, to think of it purely from a numbers perspective is is a little bit erroneous. But most people, when they think when it comes to raising a round, like what does control mean? They sort of check the box. Okay, they're not taking more than half of my company, which some investors may ask for, which is way too much in an early stage, or it just means you're taking like too much expensive money at the time. Uh, but it's a board seat. And I feel kind of like in Dallas, a lot of startups, not my clients of course, they sort of treat their board seats as like startup swag. Like, let's just give it out. I'm in a startup, oh, here's, you know, like, like board seats are not koozies. That's, that's what I feel like a lot of people are like doing out here. If you look at like a lot of the startups out here, look at their pages. It's like, there's like one founder and there's like five other people not working for the startup. And they've raised maybe like half a million dollars. I don't know what happened, but there's nothing like prestigious but having a bunch of people on your board. Technically, that's what an advisory board is for. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, the other way to control your company is with protective provisions or covenants. That's how I could control Bradley's company with just one share. I could say, Bradley gets common class A, I get preferred class, whatever, but for all these things, Bradley has to get the vote of my preferred share to do it. So that, that happens a lot, uh, or that, that's a way that people can get control with not being on the board. So there's a board vote. For a lot of things, there's a, sh a shareholder vote or a covenant that you get the consent of a group, not just all of the shareholders, but a subset or a group thereof. Uh, economic terms in Dallas, I mean, we see a lot of deals. It, like, the pre-money valuations aren't as bad as they were. Before, it used to be like, hey, let's raise a million dollars and we'll give up just 65% of our company here. I think it's sort of trended towards like the normal now where we don't really see anybody giving up more than 25% of their round. 25% is probably a good litmus test to know like if, you're, if your round's costing you more percentage than that, it's just probably either, either you're taking too much money or the deal is just not, not right for you at the time. Uh, we're not really seeing any like offensive liquidation preferences. What I mean, they're not using the liquidation preference as a downside protection. They're using it as a way to sort of like hoodwink you into thinking I really value it four million when really I was effectively did it a lot lower. Uh, we're still seeing an option pool of 10% or more. How much time do I have? A lot. Uh, in rare occasions, do we see like accruing di di dividends? I think dividends are just pretty lame. They're just, you should not have to like pay your lawyers to like put those into your charter to do it. Like, cause these are, this is all about price. Just talk about price. If you're dealing with investors, just talk pre-money, everything else should be standard, like 1x participation, well, non-participating liquidation preference, like no dividends, no accruing dividends, and uh, a decent size option pool. Option pool, if you don't know, is like a set of equities set aside for prospective future hires, consultants, outside board members, advisors, et cetera. And so I guess that's sort of my like my like take home, which I, I mean I guess I put there from like my notes. I guess you can read it too. Like don't let investors use that against. Like don't let me use that. Just talk price at the high level. Uh, as far as control terms of Dallas, here's where it gets funky. Uh, so my, my my question is: Does anybody know how Dallas angel investors get to heaven? Anybody? Anybody guess? By the amount of boards they've been on. No, that, that's not true. And we're, I think, I think they're slowly learning that over time. Um, and I was trying to figure out like, what's the cause for all this control request? Cause, and sometimes it feels like I'm watching of mice and men, but instead of like Lenny squeezing a bunny, they're squeezing like my client. And, and I think it's because frankly, like they just don't trust the younger people to run the company. And sometimes they'll admit that, and sometimes they really won't. But I think they're really good, sophisticated investors will only invest in a company because they believe those people that are there right now will be able to implement or basically do what they're saying they're going to do in the business plan. So regardless, like, be prepared if you're raising money here to sort of potentially fight for your rights. That wasn't like a Beastie Boys reference, although that's in my head right now. And you're too young to know that that means. Uh, but so one of the things we, we hear is like, 
oh, like, you're doing a Series A, so be prepared not to have board control anymore. We've probably done like 40 or 50 Series A rounds. I've never had a client after Series A give up board control. Worst case, it's a neutral board. And just for example, me, Bradley, and you as the independent that we mutually select. Like that's worst case scenario. And I said prior to Series B, it could be even like Series C or Series D. Now, if they're afraid, they don't trust you, if they really don't trust you, they probably shouldn't be investing in you, right, one. But sometimes you don't have the option to say, you don't trust me, I'll go find somebody else to invest in your company. So what, what can you do? Like you can use other methods to provide comfort to investors. So there's like information rights, there's board observer rights, there's some protective provisions that make sense that are reasonable in case anybody tries to use this against me in the future. Uh, but there's other ways that you can sort of provide or, or you know, provide comfort to your investors that you're not, I'll call it a young kid, or, or you, know, you don't have experience, or because you haven't taken a company public before, and, and they have, that you shouldn't give up control. Like you don't need an over babysitter to do this. They should be trusting in you to do it. And I think our clients realize that, our VC clients realize that. They'll say, oh, I totally trust this guy or this girl 100%, so I'm in. Uh, that's it. So I, I did a quick thing of like never agree to these terms because these terms aren't as prevalent out here. They, they pop up from time to time. Like one is non-dilution rights. So and I think this is more common out here because there's so many like real estate investors or oil and gas investors. And I, I, and I actually asked like, it's funny if you ask, ask why? Like, when you have somebody else with a strange term pop up on your term sheet, ask them why. It's amazing the response you get. Uh, usually it's, well, if you have to come back and get more money and dilute me, that means you failed in your business plan. And so I've literally had to tell people up 75, uh, or have an office on 75 saying, well, I know you typically invest in real estate and buildings, and if someone comes back to you with more money, it's usually cost overruns, and yeah, that usually goes on the promoter or the founder or whatever they call it in real estate finance or real estate investing. But in this case, real estate isn't just like the one block, not one parcel of land. Like we could do the universe. I mean, we have startups going to Mars now, or, or you know, we have bots that are now going to Mars or whatever is going on out there. So that's one thing. Um, never agreed to like dividends that pay. Like you're just paying them like with their own money. Uh, giving up control, and I put, unless you want to be like a glorified employee, and I say glorified employee because if they're really in control of everything you do, like that's, that's what you are. You have a lot of equity, but you're still an employee. Like someone is your boss. And I don't think that's why you started the company to begin with. I mean, obviously down the line, it's great to have, you know, if you're, I don't think like, I don't even know, pretend to know how much shares Zuckerberg has, but I'm pretty sure it's not a majority. I know he did something funky with like the voting control and all that, but. Yeah, like, don't give it up so early. It's, it's sort of sickening to see people do that out here. Uh, again, liquidation preference greater than 1x. Uh, not as common anymore, but there were some term sheets. Maybe from a fund that was upstairs. No, maybe not. Uh, that come out with, like, a 4x liquidation preference, or you got to pay us back 5 or, like, 8x within three years. Like, what's that about? Uh, and then last one, like personal guarantee. Uh, I've had, you know, it's funny, the only people who've asked for personal guarantees are the billionaires in Dallas. And I don't know why that is, because I don't, I mean, I guess they're trying to like, I always thought, are they asking this because they just don't want to say no and have that reputation? And they kind of want like the founders say, oh no. But I said, I told their lawyers like, so I get it, like some of my clients may get an ulcer for being a startup, it's stressful but let's not give them a heart attack. Let's not promote heart attacks. Like no personal guarantees. This isn't commercial bank. And I don't even think SVB does that, right? Yeah, like venture, like venture debt financings, I've never seen a personal guarantee. So if you're sort of a guide to raise capital in Dallas, don't let geography dictate your terms. Don't accept I'm Dallas, Dallas investor, we get crummy terms and now there's like three people on my board that I didn't know, but hey, they have like pleated slack, so it's amazing. Uh, don't be too trendy as well. This is sort of like the, like, like the counter. So a lot of people like really follow what's going on in Silicon Valley and say, oh, Mark Schuster said, 
you should never do convertible debt rounds. Well, that's one opinion. Like, convertible debt rounds still work. Or if safe's a new one, you don't have to do a safe or you're, like, you're not winning in your startup. Uh, and these rules are just suggested guidelines. So one of the rule is if you're raising a million dollars, you must give up a board seat. There's, that's not etched in stone, that's nowhere. That's not in like Delaware's corporate law, that's nowhere. Uh, and then the other one is like deal terms are not, are not binary. So if someone says, give me a board seat, and you're just like, no, don't give me a board seat. It's not like a zero or one. Like it's not zero, no board seat, one board seat. There's a lot of like middle ground. You just have to know like what to negotiate or what to ask for. And a lot of that's dependent on just asking them like what's your concern? And you get a lot of good feedback on it. And don't get upset that local investors take like forever sometimes. And usually they're taking forever because they're letting, they're waiting for somebody else to make the decision for them. That's not as bad as it was, but how many of you, okay, how many of you have raised money out here and said, and had an investor say, I'm interested, but let me know if someone else invests first? Anybody? Yeah, it happens all the time. That means, I mean, I mean, I think you should, you know, close money when you can, but it's probably not like the optimal investor for you. You want people not to sit on the fence and wait for everybody else. You want people to uh, believe in you. But it happens out here. It is still one of the biggest issues out here, I think, even with some of like the VC funds. They, they still are suffering from, from that a little bit, but it, it's getting better. Uh, but also, like, be a good shepherd to all like the new money out here. So some are like maybe extremely like, what's the word? amateurs about investing in startups. Uh, and don't, I say try to take like advantage of them, don't treat them wrong because, you know, we need them to be a successful ecosystem. And the ecosystem's a lot better for raising capital like than it ever was. And I don't know like back in the day and 16th floor, whatever. Uh, but that doesn't really matter anymore to Dallas. Like we're way beyond that. Um, so be, be a good shepherd, everyone's, everyone's on like the right path. Uh, What's my next slide? Oh, Plato's Allegory of the Cave. Does anybody know, like, can you give like, a good summary of what Plato's Allegory of the Cave is? You may have read it like in seventh grade. Yes, it's, it's what, yeah, the Matrix totally bit it, but they did a good job of it. But basically the Allegory of the Cave is, and I'm definitely gonna paraphrase and summarize, and you can't really see that, but there's a cave and there's prisoners in it. And their reality is these like shadows on, on the wall that, uh, you know, there's like some puppeteers. And that's all I know, that's, that, that, that is their reality. And, and Plato asked basically, or I think it was Socrates in the story, what if like somebody broke free and went out to like out of the cave in the light? And the idea is, would it be amazing because like that's reality? Like no, it would actually hurt. Like they get sunburned, like they'd be so bright. They like, you know, have issues with their eyes. So you know, the idea is like, would they want to go back in, in the cave? And so I thought like, how do I make this like, I'm not gonna say like, so, so here's the idea. Who are the prisoners in this scenario? Raise your hand if you think it's, it's the investors or when I say it's the investors. Okay, is it the startups? No one's gonna say it's the lawyers. <laughs> they're, they're probably thinking, well, the lawyers are the puppeteers now. Uh, you know, I, not to be, I think it's, it's like, as a, as a community, as an ecosystem, it's really all of us. And we need to like slowly like bring everybody out of this cave. And, and, and what I mean cave is this idea that we have like Dallas deal terms, accept super low valuations, give up control. Uh, let's, let's all go outside and, and see the light. It, and you know, we, we have sunblock, we have sunglasses or blue blockers. I don't know why I thought of that. But, and, and so I think we're definitely getting there and we're definitely much better off as, as an ecosystem, but there's like a long way to go. And it, events like this are great. You know, this never would have happened. Well, I'm shocked this actually happened. So this is a great event to have. There's a lot of other things that are, that are going on, but what's really gonna improve the ecosystem is hugely successful companies, period, point blank. Like that, that's it. Uh, and how do we get there? We let them grow here and stay here. So it's sort of like the, the, like the motto here, like start here, exit here. But it should also be like start here, 
fund here, exit here. So that's, I think, that's sort of it. Um, time for Q&A, I don't know how long it is. But yeah, any questions now or after? Like uh, Ryan Roberts, my Twitter handle is at Startup Lawyer. I also publish like startuplawyer.com and like shameless plug, the volunteer today uses it. So it must be legit. So thanks again for having me. Uh, any questions? Or do, do I need to like pass out a mic or? Yeah. If you have no questions, that's cool too, but yeah. I mean, I, honestly, I put that like right next to LLC. I mean, it just depends. I mean, obviously, I think there you probably could do it. I've just never seen it. Um, I, I'm not saying it, it, it can't be done. And it, I know there's like different like certifying bodies on that. Different states are accepting them. But I just I just don't know. Okay, so you want to compare um, Austin money, San Antonio money, I guess Houston money. To, to here, I mean, I, I think there was a report that like now, like here, we're doing a lot better than anywhere else. And I think that that's good. Like we've always had the natural resources here in Dallas. Like, and me, not just money, but like talented companies, entrepreneurs. Like I think so, someone told me that, it, that from like the panel upstairs, they're just like not enough like series A fundable companies. Like that's bullshit. Like there's a lot. I see them leave all the time and get funding and exit and stuff. So they're, they're here. We just haven't had the ecosystem you know, to support it. Various, like obviously Houston, probably not as enthused right now because of energy. I don't want to use like the price of oil as a reason why like venture should be good or bad in Texas. That's like the sort of opposite. And frankly, like if oil's down, maybe they should invest somewhere else. Maybe technology, I don't know. So that's it. I don't have any numbers, but I, what I've been seeing, it is better now in, in Dallas, I think, but I don't think that's like going to be temporary. I hope it's not temporary. So, any other questions? I thought I saw Bradley Joyce. When you talked about like convertible debt, convertible equity, deferred equity, you know, you talk about like what an entrepreneur should expect to go back to the financing in Dallas. Oh, pointy question. Uh, I'm biased, but they should be like. I mean, any venture lawyer, any true startup lawyer knows that no matter how much money you raise, like you're bootstrapping it. So if I have a client that raised like a series A at $8 million, that's not like money for the next like 30 years. That's like, you know, 18 months, th three years. But how much should, should, should it cost? Um, convertible instruments, debt or equity, obviously on the lower end of the range. You're not having to like redo the charter. And because there's not a ton of control terms in it, and frankly, not a lot of economic turns in it. That's probably what I forgot to say. Um, those are more favorable and, and quicker and reduce transaction costs, including like just the overall legal costs. Nodes can be anywhere from like one to $5,000, including convertible equity. It's, it, there's a lot of variables. I hate to give the whole like lawyer response, like it depends, but it really does. In that case, like seed, like seed around equity, again, sort of depends what it is, but I expect to spend like five to ten k on it, on like on like a light preferred seed round. And and what I meant by like light preferred, it's not doesn't have all the bells and whistles of like a true like series A round. And if you want to see what all the bells and whistles are, and I probably should put this on a slide for resources, go to like nvca.org. They have like model legal documents on this, and it's a lot of documents. There's a lot of stuff to go over. Or they or look at like their model term sheet um, for. You can find like you probably Google like the safe documents or the kiss documents or the series C.com documents, but yeah, anywhere from like one to ten should probably be for a true seed financing. Now, there are escalators on it, but there's a lot of assumptions to be made. Yeah, I think you had a question? Yeah. Um, do you, do you have No, so the question was, have we had clients who, I guess, gone through a bad seed round and like had to fix it? Do you mean fix it because like the like just the term sucked, or because the investor sucked, or both, yeah. or and or? Um, 
what we always strive to do is say, okay, if you need to close this money, and this happens, like they want some really random term, whether it's like non-dilution or some weird protective covenant, I always, always, always try to get an automatic termination of it upon your next round. Because that's sort of the biggest thing that can happen is you give up something that's not normal, a new investor comes in and says, what the heck is this? You gotta get this like signed away. Now, most of the times you expect people to be, to be rational and say, okay, I get it, there's a lot of money coming in, the valuation's up, I should be happy. But sometimes your current investor can be like, oh wait, I have some leverage, what else are you gonna give me? So hopefully, we, you know, any kind of good venture lawyer will see that as you're doing it, advise you like not to do it, but realize, okay, if you have to take the money, this is the only way you can keep going, maybe it's what you accept. But they'll work hard for that automatic termination ahead of time. So we don't have a lot of having to go back. Frankly, a lot of what you have, what you have to go back for is like a lost like founder you had and didn't, and didn't tell us about. So, but yeah, but it, it happens, but try to minimize it. There's really, from like a structural standpoint, there's no, there's no difference. I mean, I'm sure it affects like the valuation or what the prospective investor thinks your enterprise value or your exit potential is, but that's just sort of what the, what like the pre-money is. And we don't really give a huge opinions on that besides like, hey, you're selling too much of your company at this round. So yeah, it's like he was first. And then, yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. Yeah, so, and that's, that's it, because a, a lot of the older investors here, or, or older, older school people, they come from like the, like, well, what's your, you know, last 12 months trailing earnings or whatever, and so they go, wait, why are you worth more than a dollar? Because you're bleeding money, right? There's, there's no real way. I say just ask for a lot of money, because there's like this magic thing that it happens, is that, you usually see rounds that they don't take up more than 25%. So obviously if you get too low, like I'm not saying sell that percentage of your company for like $100, but yeah, ask for 100, ask for a million. And that, that if you can get people to agree to give you more money, like that usually ups your, your valuation. I had one client who did that. They, they went out with a deck to a VC firm and it was a half million dollar investment. And they were gonna, you know, theoretically, that'd be like a pre-money of like one and a half. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. They don't wanna invest just half a million dollars. Like, what would you do with two million dollars? Like, Ryan, we don't need it. I'm like, what if a million and a half dollars just fell on your desk? You have to spend it, like, what would you do? He was like, oh, okay, I can figure that out. They got like 1.8 million dollars. And the valuation went up high. So that's the only real way. I mean, other, other like random stuff doesn't matter. It's like, be awesome, I don't know. Like just convince, there's not, there's, but there's no like algorithm. I know people try to say like, well, if you have like one founder from, who did a PhD, that's half a million and no, like all the algorithms are just sort of fun, but not real scientific. You were next. Yeah, I just say like be keep being persistent and like an early no doesn't mean no forever. Like a lot of the good investors that we represent, like one of their big things is like persistence because they know when your company eventually like the shit's gonna hit the fan and they want to know what are you gonna do when it does. And if they see somebody come in a little early and just kind of give up, that can be bad too. And so I say start from the very beginning. There's there's nothing wrong with saying hi, I'm X and I'm doing this and I, we might be a little early, but I just want to introduce myself. That allows you to come back three months, six months. You can sort of probably back up what you said you're gonna do. That's a little bit of proof that you're actually gonna back up your you know, promises to them or promises to what you're doing. So as far as like finding, I mean, AngelList, like scour all the accelerators and all the people coming to these things. Um, you know, a lot of like the family offices in town don't have like websites, but just the more you keep out there and, and keep sort of pitching it, I think you sort of get in and just ask other entrepreneurs, like 
they're really, or if you see people get funded, just ask them. Like, who do, who do you talk to? Do you have like an old list of people you talk to? They might be able to share some of that. So it's a pretty giving community. Or it's a really good pay it forward community. Like anyone, in Dallas especially. So you know. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. You're next. Yeah, I mean, to me, it's like, what's the what's the degree of extra of valuation, right? If it's like you're coming with a valuation of like six million, and your investors want, oh, it should be four and a half, you're really like not that far apart. If you actually break down like what the percentages are based upon their investment amount, uh, but I agree, like it it, it it could be a problem where if you can't raise like around higher, it may trigger some anti dilution, but usually it's minimal. To be quite honest. Obviously, they're not like very enthused about it. They may have some protective provisions upon that round, but at the same time, that also gives you like some leverage to get the higher valuation of the next round. Like we have to raise above this, and it's usually not that much more. So it depends. I mean, if it's like you know five and fifteen, that's a big deal. If it's you know six and eight, you over it. You and then you. Yeah, I got you. Oh yeah. Yeah. What part? What was the last part? Well, I mean, I think technically you have to have like one person on your board of directors to have a valid corporation. Of you know, the way I say that is is you know, at the early stages, like the founding team should really be the ones dictating like what is the path of the company. Because do you really want like four outside people to dictate whether you guys should pivot before you've had like a huge launch? No, that's not a great discussion, right? Uh, but right, I did mention like advisory board members. Now, these are people, they call it a board of advisors. It's definitely not formal. These people have no voting rights for what you want to do. But I don't even know why it's called a board, because they don't they never meet at one time, too. It's just a group of people that you just have is, you know. Sort of it's like a graduated mentor who you've decided to have, you know, typically an advisor agreement with maybe a small percentage of options in your company. But they're more of like a sounding board. They can give you like strategic contacts, help with some funding potentially. I don't know. But yeah, I think that's good to, to have that. But sort of like a board, like don't go overboard on it. I see like, here's our 12 advisory board members. And then you just look like you're like, you're, you've created a new website for like tech wildcatters or like the deck or something, all their mentors. So don't, don't do that. Not that they can, I mean, they, they can do that, but not, don't do it as a startup. So yeah. Was there one more? Any questions? Are we close to timeout? Yeah. One more and then you. Yeah. Yeah, so I think one thing you do, I forgot you, right? Sorry. Um, I think you don't just raise here. Like, we have a, like, like don't just, like, start here, try to raise here, but go to, go coast to coast, go international. We have clients that are in Dallas, they have money from Europe, they have money from Asia. Like, don't limit yourself, like, from a geographic standpoint. It, it is like a hunt. You have to be, you have to be very persistent uh, about it. Um, but I was trying to say more the mentality, like if you are raising here, you can get really beat down by it because you hear a lot of no's. Like I used to joke, like if you want to start just practicing your pitch, just go to like all the angel groups in town. <laughs> They'll tell you no and it's amazing because you're not, you know, you didn't make a million dollars in like EBITDA or however they say it like last year. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, you can talk offline about it or shoot me an email or on Twitter about it. But was there one more? Do we have time? Okay, that's it. I'll be outside for a little bit. You want to talk more about it? Yeah. Yeah.